Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. With your Fed decision, it's Mike McKee. There is no change to interest rate. There are a number of small changes to the statement, but this is not a see you in September announcement. The Fed's forward guidance remains unchanged. Quote, the committee does not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. There's also no change in the overall assessment that economic activity has continued to expand at a solid pace. All of the adjustments are basically to adjectives. Job gains have moderated, the statement says, instead of remain strong. Unemployment has moved up, but remains low. Inflation has eased over the past year, but remains somewhat elevated. And in recent months, there has been some further progress toward the 2% inflation goal. If there is a hint about the future, it's this. Instead of saying risks to employment and inflation have moved into better balance, the statement now says the committee is attentive to the risks on both sides of its dual mandate. The decision was unanimous, and that's basically it. If there is going to be a hint about a September move, it's going to be up to Chairman Powell. It's a two-part story. Mike McKee, this was the first part. The second part starts in about 29 minutes with that news conference and Chairman Powell. Let's get to the equity market. We stay positive on the S&P 500, up by about 1.5%. On the Nasdaq 100, up by 25 In the bond market, yields look a little something like this. We're down about two basis points on a 10-year. The move at the front end of the curve, it's a small one, but notable, up by about two basis points on a two-year at 4.38.32. I just want to get to those changes that Mike McKee identified. If you go back to the second paragraph of the June statement, the last line of that paragraph read as follows. The economic outlook is uncertain and the committee remains highly attentive to inflation risk. If you go to the second paragraph and the last line of the statement that just dropped, the economic outlook is uncertain and the committee is attentive to the risk to both sides of its dual mandate. And Lisa, this is the story of the dual mandate and the risks around it coming into balance. That looks like the the way they formalized it this time around in the statement. And I just wonder how much the chairman builds on that in the news conference in 28 minutes. I want to pick up on your point that the bond market isn't moving that much. There's only an increase of about two basis points on the front end. And that is why exactly that. They recognize the risk that the labor market is one that they have to care about. This sets up Jackson Hole for him to come out and sort of change the framework. And then for September to be that first rate cut, no one's changing that view based on this particular statement. The balance of risks has shifted and you start to appear, see it appear just a little bit incrementally in the statement. The decision, rates unchanged. We're looking for a move still in September to Lisa's point. We still have a news conference in front of us and Jackson Hole, the annual get together at Jackson Hole, Wyoming, about a month away. With us around the table, I'm pleased to say the former Fed Vice Chair, Richard Clower, is with us. Still with us. This is Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Rich, it's good to see you, sir. Let's start with you. You listened to Mike. You saw the changes in the statement. What do you make of what we just heard? Well, I'm a bit surprised, actually. I mean, not with the adjectives. They needed to change some adjectives up. But I was a bit surprised about the reference to the, the attuned and attentive to the balanced uh, uh, outlook. I mean, that's certainly correct. The chair's been making uh, that, that point. But I think it is uh, relevant that they included it uh, in the statement. He will certainly, I think, reinforce it uh, in the press uh, conference. And I, just think, I do think it does tee up Jackson Hole. There'll be some more information before then. I look at, and this show's the best one we've ever done. We've got Dudley with his important Bloomberg opinion piece a couple, a uh, number of days ago. And I want to go to you on what you own, which is the high ground on the ex ante, ex post debate. <laughs> you've got the Economist magazine article you did a year or whatever ago. You've got your January 2022 context and consequences speech. You want an ex ante aspirational Fed. I don't hear that here. They're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting. They are waiting. I think they are, they are getting greater confidence. But I think the key point, not, not to toot my own horn, is my view all along. But it's okay. It's surveillance. You can <laughs> do that. My, my view does all along, and I think I've said so on this show, is that the Powell Fed, really, the goal was to get inflation to two point something. And then they would start thinking about the next step, which would be easing, not running an easy policy, but removing restrictions. So I do think this is what we're seeing. And if we do get the cut in September, as I think we and markets expect, it will be because they expect inflation X antis to continue to fall. But are we anywhere near that? I'm, I'm sorry. This is an ex-post Fed going back to Arthur Burns. They're yeah. as data dependent as yeah. I've ever seen. Yeah. 
They are data dependent, but I think that they attenuated and focused on the statement today, emphasized both sides of the mandate. So I do think they're looking at just the labor market as well as the inflation data. Bob, what's your take on this? It seems like it's less dovish, a little bit more balanced than you initially thought. Do you think this just is uh, trying to move as incrementally as possible? I think they preserved full optionality heading into Jackson Hole. I also think that central bankers are mindful of what happened to the ECB earlier this year, where you could have made the same argument. If you're going to go next month, why not go this month? And then, of course, you saw what happened. So I, I, I don't see too much different than what we expected other than they just decided to maintain the full optionality. We'll see what happens as we roll into September. We're still very much expecting 25 basis points in September. And Neil Dutta of Renmark just writes in, publishes, with language like this, it means the Fed will have to make a more pronounced shift in language in September. I'm surprised stocks are holding up well on this statement. Perhaps equities are looking ahead to the news conference. The news conference starts in about 24 minutes' time. It goes on to say, the Fed is waiting for additional data. Can they even articulate why inflation might reaccelerate from here? Can we pick up on that question, Bob? Can you articulate the risks around inflation? Why might it reaccelerate from here? Corporate profitability still looks great. We talked about S&P 500 earnings. They're coming in ahead of expectations. You look at the guidance companies are giving you. They're up 12% next quarter. So we're not in a recession. We're slowing down in some parts of it. Um, we'll see. I, you know, I, I can't find really the argument what's going to cause inflation to reaccelerate, to be honest. Well, Rich, we were talking about how this was definitely going to be unanimous. And I wonder how much of a wrangling of cats there is in the room and whether this is basically a representation of that, that there's some members who believe that inflation has been killed. It is nowhere in sight that labor is important. And then you have others who say, well, you know, wait for the year over year comps. Is that kind of what we're seeing here? We I think it could be an element. You know, we've had some members of the committee, and I know most of these folks, but it's a different committee than the one I was on. And many of them do emphasize both sides of the dual uh, mandate. So um, I'm sure that reflects a number of folks' views. I, I do think, though, this is a committee that, that, that certainly uh, got burned earlier in this year because the inflation data went the wrong way. And to their credit, they became very data dependent, as Tom uh, indicated. Um, I, I think that they put it this way. I think they think they're going to go in September. Uh, there is a range of data where they wouldn't, but I think it's a pretty small Range And I think that's really the balance they're trying to strike. And I think we'll hear that in the press conference. We were, today. Speak we were speaking earlier uh, with James Bullard, formerly yeah. of the St. Louis Fed. And he was talking about how he always raised the question at meetings that if you wanted to cut rates, most certainly at the next meeting, why not cut them now? Bob was sort of uh, discussing that earlier. And it sets up this sort of difficult period of time where every data point could potentially upset the apple cart if it doesn't comply. Do you think that they are in that zone right now? I don't really. I mean, I've certainly during my time on the committee, we found ourselves there a couple of, of times. So it can happen. Um, I think the, the data we have gotten, you know, the chair did a lot of uh, communication before a blackout and the data since then has reinforced that that view. So I think there's a pretty wide range of data where they'll feel comfortable going uh, in in September. So I don't think they're in that danger zone. Right Can you now. confirm that Jim actually said those things at the FOMC meeting? Well, of course, I, I would never reveal what was said <laughs> in an FOMC meeting except what I say, all the all the brilliant things I said. So. Diane Swank joins us now from KPMG, alongside former Fed Vice Chair Rich Clarida and Bob Michael of JP Morgan. Diane, I want to get into this statement that came out about eight minutes ago. What do you make of it, the incremental changes, and were you looking for something bigger? I wasn't looking for anything bigger, and I think one of the key issues here is we saw Powell talk about in his congressional testimony when pushed on the dual mandate, he said, listen, this is the thing that keeps me up awake, awake at night. The number one thing that keeps me awake at night is that overshooting, the overtightening. So that is in there, and that is what opens the door a crack, not wide open, which is what we expected for September. And I do think they do think they're going to move in September, and I agree wholeheartedly with Rich on this. I think the 
other issue is there's sort of this tale of two economies we're seeing emerge out there. The one that's in the household survey that's close to but not yet triggered the SOM rule, which is what got Bill Dudley up in arms and how weak employment has been in the household survey. And the establishment survey, the GDP data, other jobs data that suggests the economy is still on solid footing. And right now, the Fed has been opting into more of that establishment survey where payrolls have held up, although that they're not quite as strong as they've been. We're going to get probably some good public sector hiring in the jobs numbers on Friday again, which will help buoy those overall numbers, adding to some weakness in the private sector. But I think that's important is that the Fed is looking at this and they're weighing which is the right stuff? And, you know, really getting to Rich's point, too, there isn't just one piece of data that the market keeps looking for that could tip the apple cart. The Fed is looking at the totality of the data. And that last line really gets to that point. The totality of the data will allow them to go in September. And they don't want to make the same mistake the ECB made, move and then have to freeze and be in a purgatory. Their credibility is at stake. They want to make sure inflation is coming down. But I agree with Rich, they'll still cut before inflation reaches its 2% target, anticipating that the economy, by lifting off that restriction, the economy will get there. We have swank and clarity with this. Bob Michael, maybe a question for you on the economics of the moment. Are we slaves to measured? We have measured for decades. We're being very measured where maybe other central banks aren't. Are we just just so afraid to move and we're over careful, over cautious, because once we move, we've got to move in a measured vector? I feel like we're back to the Greenspan Fed, yeah. where every word is so carefully thought out, it makes you want to overanalyze it. And no one can give an inch. If the wrong word is in there, then the FOMC okay. gets concerned about the market pricing and hundreds of basis points of rate cuts and risk assets being up tens Let's of go, percent. Okay, let, go, please go. But ahead. we're talking about, and Rich touched on it, we're in, I think, very restrictive range, 25 basis points. Right. You're not in a loose monetary world with money flooding all over the place. You're still restrictive. You've got to start right. that journey somewhere. Well, this is too important. Lawrence Meyer, Washington University, is a monograph, a term at the Fed. He tore Greenspan apart that it was a dictatorship. <laughs> Are we getting to the point now no one can dissent and everyone's measured because we're measured and appropriate? No, I think no one has descended because two years ago, inflation was too damn high and they were all agreed they wanted to get it lower. It'll get more interesting as we get close. But what I want to say to invoke the Olympics uh, now, this is a Fed that really wants to stick the landing. You know, they won't say this word, but yep. their, their projection and what we're seeing in Bloomberg consensus and elsewhere is a soft landing and, and they want to stick it. And, uh, you know, the data is now solid. It's, it's moving in the right direction. And so, uh, you know, getting back to the Greenspan Fed, there was a soft landing or so in, in those years. Alan Blinder has written they're, they're not, you know, common, but we do see them. I think towards in 2019, I think the Powell Fed got a soft landing. We don't see it in the data because we got the pandemic. The economy looked pretty good in January of 2020. So they're trying to stick the soft landing. Forget yeah. about sticking the landing. <laughs> Let's just throw them in the sand. The water's fine. <laughs> we'll be okay. You win. <laughs> Better analogy. Right. Okay. There's another, there's another analogy. Matt Hornback puts this and, out earlier, and I'd love your thoughts on this, Diane. Basically, the Olympic motto to carry on with this reads, uh -huh. faster, higher, stronger together. Could have been used to talk about central banks yeah. globally yeah. altogether. Now, it, it might be at more about slower, lower, weaker together. Diane, how much is that looming over this Fed meeting? The idea not of synchronized swimming or synchronized rate cuts, but this idea of trying to sort of get, take an edge off for the rest of the world that really does seem to be dealing a little bit more with some negative growth. I don't think that's the Fed's main concern, and I'm sure Rich will back me up on that. I remember seeing uh, Ben Bernanke actually go after another central banker who said, you guys need to change your policy to help us out. And he said, that's not our problem, basically, <laughs> at a Jackson Hole meeting. So that is not the Fed's primary concern. That said, a strong dollar helps us out down the road in keeping goods prices lower. So that helps the Fed out. I think what's more important here in terms of the Olympic analogies is that the road to gold is often paved 
paved with tears and <laughs> obstacles. And I think people forget that, um, and I, I'm thinking of Simone Biles here, I'm sorry, she's my hero and heroine at this point in time. But I'm thinking about, you know, soft landings, people forget that the 1994-95 situation, it looks great on paper, I lived it. I remember it. Rich, you lived it yeah. too. It was ugly at the time. Chairman Greenspan's reappointment as his third term as Fed chair was held up for four months in 1996 because he nearly crashed the economy in 1995 and people were so angry at him for not um, easing sooner. And it was his own colleagues, including Janet Yellen on the Fed, that got him to experiment with productivity growth and intense foreign competition, that bringing down inflation and allowing the unemployment rate to fall instead of using monetary policy to do it. That is really important to remember, is that soft landings are not easy. They look good on paper, yeah. but getting there can be a hard path. Diana, where does the confidence come? Where does it come from that unemployment stabilizes at these levels and doesn't carry on shifting higher into year end? What underpins that? Well, I think I, I don't know if unemployment is going to stay there or not. It often moves up slowly and then moves up rapidly. All I know is that even Claudia Sam, who wants the Fed to cut right now, has argued her own rule might not be applicable in the post-pandemic economy because of all the changes we've seen. We've seen much of the rise in unemployment has come from more people seeking jobs, an increase in the participation rate, particularly among prime age workers. We've seen an influx of foreign workers, foreign born workers accounting for over 70% of the growth in the civilian labor force since February of 2020. That's helped to buoy the unemployment rate as opposed to a surge in layoffs. That doesn't mean there aren't stresses in the labor market. That doesn't mean there aren't still problems. But at the end of the day, what is it that people complain most about? They can complain most about the high level of prices still. And that's something that the Fed also has to keep in front of its mind. And I think that's where we're at. At the end of the day, we don't want to lose this and not hit that soft landing, but it's a rocky road to get there. I think we're still going to make it, given the fact that we saw the positive of consumers pushed back in the second quarter on price hikes and retailers and producers capitulated, they rolled back prices on goods, and we saw a rebound in growth, doubling the pace of the first quarter, driven in large part by a rebound in consumer spending. That's the Goldilocks scenario towards a soft landing. There's this issue, Bob, we're looking at market pricing, and right now it seems like this is consensus, that they are going to land the soft landing, mm -hmm. even though it is sort of uh, a rarity or a white elephant. Do you think that the market has overpriced that soft landing or even underpriced it because the internal skepticism just keeps on roaring? No, I think the markets are right on track with the soft landing. And if it in fact happens, the Fed can bring down rates a fair amount and the markets will continue to appreciate. Um, I think what's different this time is the Fed and investors have a lot more real-time information. I was around in 94, 95. I was around in 81. And you didn't have that information. And now you have it. It's real-time. It's live. You can see what's going on. Businesses have it. Households have it. And it, maybe it gives policymakers a false sense of comfort, but they have that sense of comfort which really kind of leaves the market kind of in the way, uh, sort of in the same boat that the Fed is in. And I wonder, Rich, you know, if you were on, still on the Fed, how much the Fed looks at the market to kind of gauge progress, sort of follows them, if you will, because they are gauging real-time data. And if anything, this is the collective will. And I love the war stories from the mid-1950s from everybody. <laughs> but I wonder if, you know, if that's something that they could, they could really kind of sink their teeth into. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, I'll just speak for, for myself, but uh, you're, you're looking at the market, uh, hopefully to try to extract signal. There's always noise. You have to be honest with yourself. Um, but it's particularly relevant for things like the growth outlook and the inflation uh, outlook. Uh, you, you need to know what is being expected. That's a key input to monetary policy, our, our expectations. I, I gave One of my speeches at the Fed was on this point of avoiding the hall of mirror problems by looking at market prices. So I'm not saying it's, it's easy, but I don't think there's an alternative. I want to cross back over to Diane. Diane, I know you've got to go in a second. Just a quick final word. A question for Chairman Powell in this news conference. Diane, what would it be? 
Well, this is on communications. I think it's going to be very hard for the Fed to communicate. We've already seen financial markets are trying to front run the Fed on a larger cut in September. Yeah. How do they calibrate their communications to deal with what may be more measured cuts? Interesting. Dan, thank you. As always, Dan Swank there of KPMG. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. The Fed decision came out about 20 minutes ago, unchanged on interest rates. And the statement, largely unchanged as well, just some incremental changes. So the focus on the news conference now, which starts at about 10 minutes time. With us, joining us now, I'm pleased to say, is Mike Gapin of Bank of America. Michael, going into this news conference, very incremental changes in that statement. Were you expecting more than what they delivered? No, I... I I, I wasn't. I, I think with the strong growth numbers we received, the right place for them to make adjustments is exactly where they did. Reflected a little bit in cooling labor market uh, conditions, reflect a little bit more progress on inflation, kind of pin down and nail down that balance of risks argument because that's what the chair had said uh, in front of Congress. So I think this was the right incremental move. I think the Fed feels that it's in a sweet spot right now, that the data is moving in its direction. So it's getting closer. It just needs a little bit more. And then, and then it, that confidence, that nebulous confidence may be there. So this is what we were expecting. We weren't expecting a big lean in either direction from the statement. The market, as you know, Mike, has been looking for September and a baby step towards that. You and the team have been looking for December. What separates you at the moment, Michael, the data that backs up your view? What separates you from the rest of the street at the moment? Well, I'd say we have, we have less concern about downside risk to the economy. We certainly are watching for it and, and looking out for our, our, that we may be wrong on, on this view. But the economy grew at a pretty solid pace in the second quarter. And yes, things are moderating and, and cooling, but I still think that there's a lot of resilience to both the economy and, and labor markets, and, and we'll see. Maybe there's a little unevenness in this inflation story. But certainly September, a September cut has moved a lot closer to our, our, our baseline. So yeah, we're still in, in December, but we've got two employment reports and two inflation reports between now and now and then. Uh, you know, further progress in, in those two variables, a little bit weaker employment, kind of repeats of what we just saw in June inflation, that could easily put a cut on the table uh, in September. So September can happen, but it may not. So I think that's how I'd frame it right Michael, now. Michael, let's just put a bow on this. <laughs> what does further progress look like to you in the two labor market reports, the two inflation reads that we get until the next uh, meeting? Well, I think the, the labor market report is, is maybe a little more asymmetric. I, you know, a strong report is probably not going to prevent them from cutting, but obviously a, a weak one could. Uh, so if they feel the labor market is softening more than they expect, um, they could go in that regard. Otherwise, I think to your earlier question of what's going to cause inflation to rise, I can't see it. I, I agree, but I don't think what they can rule out right now is that inflation settles in at a level that feels a little uncomfortable for them. So I think on the margin, a little more evidence that, no, we're not going to get stuck with, say, core PCE in the high twos. It does look like it's moving lower. So one or two more reports that give them confidence about that, then I think is probably enough. Speaking of discomfort, we know a topic they're uncomfortable with, and that's politics. And if it comes up in this news conference, we know what Chairman Powell's going to do. <laughs> He's going to ignore it. But there was a letter sent to him by Senator Warren and company. And TK, there's a quote in this letter. The immediate press release read as follows. The failure to cut rates would indicate that the Fed is giving in to bullying and is putting political considerations ahead of its dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices. So you've got the Republicans saying if you cut rates, it's political. And you've got the Democrats saying if you don't cut rates, it's political. Sort of stuck in a rock and a hard place between the both. And what's important here, John, it's so, so important, is that Richard Claret is one of the people that bought history back to economics with his work at Columbia. I sat at the Fed with you in that magnificent library yeah. of first editions, and Elizabeth Warren reached down and said, take the book off the shelf. And I took Torsten Veblen, The Theory of the Leisure Class, <laughs> off the shelf, and you and I were talking about it. This is a few years back. That's what Senator Warren's talking about, is the gilded age. Are we in a gilded age where the elites are talking only to the fancy people and indirectly doing monetary policy only for the fancy people? Well, no. In, in, in one word, I, I, I think, you know, the Fed has the dual mandate. Inflation was too high. They're focused on both sides. I think 
the economy's in, in a place where it can certainly uh, adjust and, and wait another two months until the cuts uh, commence. So I, I, I would push back uh, on that. Mike Gaffin, would you push back? Just how relevant is the U.S. election and U.S. politics? Well, the way I would frame this, and I think Rich would agree, um, I was formerly on staff at at the board, and I learned quickly that no matter what you do or don't do, somebody's going to be upset. And one side will complain or the other will complain. So I think you learn quickly the best thing to do is to do what you think is right. Uh, So I would would put it at that. So they have competing opinions here. The the right thing to do is to do what they feel is right. Mike, I'll finish with the same question I finished with Diane Swong. Questions for the chairman. If Michael McKee's listening, going into this news conference, what's the number one question for you? Well, the, the chair has said that they could ease if there's unexpected weakness in the labor market, which is actual data that comes in below their expectation. But what about preemptive easing? on the risk of labor market weakening. I think that might get at the gap between market pricing and what the Fed thinks it will deliver. Mike Gapen, thank you, sir. Michael Gapen there of Bank of America. The news conference about five minutes away. Bob, there is a question here about what kind of interest rate cut it would be when we get one, if we get one in September. Is it a risk management decision? Is it a mid-cycle adjustment, the beginning of something much bigger than that? Do you think they have to frame it at this point? Do you think they have to characterize what it might be? I think they do, and and I think they'd like it to be part of the normalization process that they've achieved their targets on both sides of their dual mandate, and they could start to bring down what is a restrictive policy. Michael Gapin echoed your speech of January 2022. It's about ex-ante aspiration. I don't want you to voice for the chairman. I know that's inappropriate. But how does he voice the aspiration of getting out front here in six, seven minutes? Well, I think he'll stick to the mandate and he'll stick to documenting the progress. And and again, uh, he won't use the word soft landing, uh, although that's, I think, what they're trying to uh, what they're trying to uh, achieve. And I think Governor Waller's done a very effective job in his many speeches in making uh, the point that they they have they have time because the data is holding up quite well, you know, it was a very bold call a couple of years ago for Waller to say, we can disinflate without this huge pain in the labor market. I think they were prepared to take it. If it was required, it hasn't happened. And so now I think they're even more focused on mm-hmm. the soft uh, landing. And I do think they do want to avoid uh, a premature declaration of, of mission uh, accomplished. Because even if underlying inflation is right going to target, there's always noise in the data. And two or three months of noise on the wrong side is a bit uncomfortable. Rich, there's this feeling baked into markets that Fed Chair Jay Powell is much more dovish than the statement might suggest. Are you expecting that tone to kind of come out in the news conference? Interesting. You know, we heard a lot from Chair Powell uh, at Centra on Capitol Hill, uh, sitting down at the Economic Club of, of, of D.C. I've gone through and looked at that. I would actually expect him to stick pretty close to that, which, which was very balanced, uh, not declaring victory, but acknowledging progress. Emphasizing, as the statement does today, uh, that they are really attuned and attentive to both sides of the dual uh, mandate. You know, so there are some times where I think the press conference is really the chair using a lot of this is what I think. I think we'll hear a lot of this is what we think today. I think the committee's pretty, pretty tight, uh, tightly uh, aligned on where they are. Bob, what are you listening for today? Um, I actually think he will come out a bit more dovish. I think that's the way he's rolled the last several meetings. He surprised us by deviating from the script and indicating that, yeah, you know, he could see rate cuts um, on the horizon. Um, I can't take my eyes off of the last sentence in the second uh, paragraph where the committee is attentive to the risk of both sides of its dual mandate. I got what I wanted, at least, which is acknowledgement of risks in the labor market. The more I look at that, the more it's clear to me that they're going in September. If I were Mike McKee, a lot of people tried to press the Fed on what their neutral long-term rate is. I would ask him, at what level is the Fed funds rate no longer restrictive? Do you think they can answer that, Rich? Well, I I think they won't answer that. (laughs) I think they they have, and this is one where there are probably 19 different opinions on, on the committee. One thing I'll say a little bit is right now, as I look at my Bloomberg screen, or I did 25 minutes ago, uh, September was more than 100% priced in. And, and even I wouldn't say it's, it's 100%. There are data 
there's data we could get between now and then that, where they might not go. So that's why I skew a little bit to being a little bit more balanced than maybe dovish, but you know, we'll find out. I'm pleased you brought up Central Portugal because I think it's really important to reflect on the comments from Chairman Powell back in Central Portugal at the ECB's annual get together. Chairman Powell was talking about the strength of the labor market and the strength of the labor market being a reason for them to wait, that they have time, they can wait and see a few more months of data maybe. And it's his characterization again in this news conference of the labor market that I think matters off the back of that incremental change in yeah. the statement that you're all picking up on around the table, that last line of the second paragraph. You've seen this incrementally in the Fed speeches over the last few weeks, Lisa, the last month. They're placing greater emphasis on the other side of the mandate in a way that it wasn't even part of the conversation a year or so ago. Think about where we've come from. Two years ago, Jackson Hole, August 2022, pain pain to get inflation down. The focus was getting inflation down. You can start to hear the focus shifting to the labor market.